The crowd has invited a small group of friends over to watch the Saturday afternoon football game on television. Achilles has already arrived, but the tortoise and his friend the sloth are still awaited. Could that be our friends are riding up on that unusual one-wheeled vehicle? Ah, my friends, I'm so glad you could make it. May I present my old and beloved acquaintance, Mr. Sloth, and this is Achilles. I believe you know the tortoise. This is the first time I can recall making the acquaintance of a bicyclops. Pleased to meet you, Achilles. I've heard many fine things said about the bicyclopean species. Likewise, I'm sure. May I ask you about your elegant vehicle? Our tandem unicycle, you mean? Hardly elegant. It's just a way for two to get from A to B at the same speed. It's built by a company that also makes teeter-teeters. I see, I see. What is that knob on it? That's the gear shift. Aha! Uh -huh. And how many speeds does it have? One, including reverse. Most models have fewer, but this is a special model. It looks like a very nice tandem unicycle. Oh, Mr. Crabbe, I wanted to tell you how much I enjoyed hearing your orchestra perform last night. Thank you, Achilles. Were you there by any chance, Mr. Sloth? No, I couldn't make it, I'm sad to say. I was participating in a mixed singles ping-ping tournament. It was quite exciting, because my team was involved in a one-way tie for first place. Did you win anything? Certainly did. A two-sided Mobius strip made out of copper. It is silver-plated on one side and gold-plated on the other. Congratulations, Mr. Sloth! Thank you. Well, do tell me about the concert. It was a most enjoyable performance. We played some pieces by the Bach twins. The famous Joe and Sebastian. One and the same. And there was one work that made me think of you, Mr. Sloth. A marvellous piano concerto for two left hands. The next to last and only movement was a one-voice fugue. You can't imagine its intricacies. For our finale, we played Beethoven's Ninth Zenfali. At the end, everyone in the audience rose and clapped with one hand. It was overwhelming. Oh, I'm sorry I missed it. But do you suppose it's been recorded? At home, I have a fine hi-fi to play it on. The best two-channel monaural system money can buy. I'm sure you can find it somewhere. Well, my friends, the game is about to begin. Who's playing today, Mr. Crabbe? I believe it's home team versus visitors. Uh, oh no, that was last week. I think this week it's out of towners. I'm rooting for home team. I always do. Oh, how conventional. I never root for home team. The closer a team lives to the Antipodes, the more I root for it. Oh, so you live in the Antipodes? I've heard it's charming to live there, but I wouldn't want to visit them. They're so far away. And the strange thing about them is that they don't get any closer, no matter which way you travel. That's my kind of place. It's game time. I think I'll turn on the TV. He walks over to an enormous cabinet with a screen, underneath which is an instrument panel as complicated as that of a jet airplane. He flicks a knob, and the football stadium appears in bright, vivid colour on the screen. Good afternoon, fans. Well, it looks like that time of year has rolled around again when home team and out of town face each other on the gridiron and play out their classic pigskin rivalry. It's been drizzling on and off this afternoon and the field's a little wet, but despite the weather, it promises to be a fine game, especially with that great pair of eight-backs playing for home team, Ted Zilger and Callum Perumi. And now here's Pilipic kicking off for home team. It's in the air. Flamson takes it for out of towners and runs it back. He's to the 20, the 25, the 30, and down at the 32. That was Mool in on the tackle for home team. A superb run back. Did you see how he was almost tackled by Quilker, but somehow broke away? Oh, don't be silly, Crab. Nothing of the kind happened. Quilker did not tackle Flamson. There's no need to confuse poor Achilles or the rest of us with hocus-pocus about what almost happened. It's a fact, with no almosts, ifs, ands, or buts. Here's the instant replay. Just watch number 79, Quilker, come in from the side, surprising Flamson, and just about tackle him. Just about. Bah. Such a graceful manoeuvre. What would we do without instant replays? It's first down and ten for out of town. Model takes the ball, hands off to Orwick. It's a reverse. Orwick runs around to the right, handing off to Flamson. A double reverse, folks. And now Flamson hands it to Treef. It goes down twelve yards behind scrimmage. A twelve-yard loss on a triple reverse. I love it. A sensational play. But, Mr. S, I thought you were rooting for out of town. They lost twelve yards on the play. They did? Oh, well, who cares, as long as it was a beautiful play. Let's see it again. And so the first half of the game passes.
the end of the third quarter, a particularly crucial play comes up the home team. They are behind by eight points. It's third down and ten, and they badly need a first down. The ball is hiked to Ted Zilliger, who fades back, looking for a receiver and fakes to Quilker. There's Palindromi playing wide right with nobody near him. Ted Zilliger spots him and fires a low pass to him. Palindromi snatches it out of the air and... Oh! He steps out of bounds. What a crushing blow for home team, folks. If Palindromi hadn't stepped out of bounds, he could have run all the way to the end zone for a touchdown. Let's watch the subjunctive instant replay. And so on the screen, the same lineup appears as before. The ball is hiked to Ted Zilliger, who fades back, looking for a receiver and fakes to Quilker. There's Palindromi playing wide right with nobody near him. Ted Zilliger spots him and fires a low pass to him. Palindromi snatches it out of the air and he almost steps out of bounds, but he's still in bounds and it's clear all the way to the end zone. Palindromi streaks in for a touchdown for home team. Well, folks, that's what would have happened if Palindromi hadn't stepped out of bounds. Wait a minute. Was there a touchdown or wasn't there? Oh no, that was just the subjunctive instant replay. They simply follow the hypothetical a little way out, you know. That is the most ridiculous thing I ever heard of. Next thing you know, they'll be inventing concrete earmuffs. Subjunctive instant replays are a little unusual, aren't they? Not particularly, if you have a subjunctive. Is that one grade below a junctive? Not at all. It's a new kind of TV which can go into the subjunctive mode. They're particularly good for football games and such. I just got mine. Why does it have so many knobs and fancy dials? So you can tune it to the proper channel. There are many channels broadcasting in the subjunctive mode and you want to be able to select from them easily. Could you show us what you mean? I'm afraid I don't quite understand what all this talk of broadcasting in the subjunctive mode is about. Oh, it's quite simple really. You can figure it out yourself. I'm going into the kitchen to fix some french fries, which I know are Mr. Slow's weakness. Mmm. Go to it, crab. French fries are my favourite food. What about the rest of you? I could devour a few. Likewise, but, but wait, before you go into the kitchen, is there some trick to using your subjunctive? Not particularly. Just continue watching the game, and whenever there's a near miss of some sort, or whenever you wish things had gone differently in some way, just fiddle with the dials and see what happens. You can't do it any harm, though you may pick up some exotic channels. I wonder what he means by that. Oh well, let's get back to this game. I was quite wrapped up in it. It's fourth down for Out of Town with home team receiving. Out of Town is in punt formation with Ted Zilliger playing deep. Orwitz is back to kick and he gets a long high one away. It's coming down near Ted Zilliger. Grab it, Ted Zilliger. Give those Out of Towners a run for their money. And lands in a puddle. Kaplush! It takes a weird bounce. Now Sprunk is madly scrambling for the ball. It looks like it just barely grazed Ted Zilliger on the bounce and then slipped away from him. It's ruled a fumble. The referee is signalling that the formidable Sprunk has recovered for out of town on the home team seven. It's a bad break for home team. Oh well, that's the way the cookie crumbles. Oh no, if only it hadn't been raining. Another of those confounded hypotheticals. Why are the rest of you always running off into your absurd worlds of fantasy? If I were you, I would stay firmly grounded in reality. No subjunctive nonsense is my motto, and I wouldn't abandon it even if someone offered me a hundred, nay, a hundred and twelve French fries. Say, that gives me an idea. Maybe by suitably fiddling with these knobs, I can conjure up a subjunctive instant replay in which it isn't raining, there's no puddle, no weird bounce, and Ted Zilliger doesn't fumble. I wonder. Ah, but I haven't any idea what these different knobs do. Let's just try a few of them. It's fourth down for Out of Town with home team receiving. Out of Town is in punt formation with Ted Zilliger playing deep. Orwitz is back to kick and he gets a long high one away. It's coming down near Ted Zilliger. Grab it, Ted Zilliger. Give those Out of Towners a run for their money. And lands in a puddle. Kaplush. Oh, it bounces right into his arms. Now Sprunk is madly scrambling after him, but he's got good blocking and he steers his way clear of the middle Sprunk and now he's got an open field ahead of him. Look at that, folks. He's to the 50, the 40, the 30, the 20, the 10. Touchdown! Touchdown for home team! Well, fans, that's how it would have gone if footballs were spheres instead of oblate spheroids, but in reality, home team loses the ball and out of towns take over on the home team's seven yard line. Oh well, that's the way the ball bounces. What do you think of that, Mr. Sloat? And Achilles gives a smirk in the direction of the Sloat, but the latter is completely oblivious to its devastating effect as he is busy watching the crab arrive with a large platter with 112, nay, 100 large and delicious French fries and napkins for all. So, how do you three find my subjunct TV? Most disappointing, Crab, to be quite frank. It seems to be badly out of order. It makes pointless excursions into nonsense at least half the time. If it belonged to me, I would give it away immediately to someone like you, Crab. But of course it doesn't belong to me. 
It's quite a strange device. I tried to rerun a play to see how it would have gone under different weather conditions, but the thing seems to have a will of its own. Instead of changing the weather, it changed the football shape to round instead of football shaped. Now tell me, how can a football not be shaped like a football? That's a contradiction in terms. How preposterous. Such tame games. I thought you'd surely find more interesting subjectives. How would you like to see how the last play would have looked if the game had been baseball instead of football? Oh, an outstanding idea. The crab twiddles two knobs and steps back. There are four away and four away? That's right, fans, four away. When you turn football into baseball, something's got to give. Now, as I was about to say, there are four away with out of town in the field and home team up. Ted Zilliger is at bat. Out of town is in bunt formation. Orwitz raises his arm to pitch and he gets a long high ball away. It's heading straight to Ted Zilliger. Smash it, Ted Zilliger. Give those out of towners a home run for their money. But it seems to be a spitball as it takes a strange curve. Now Sprunk is madly scrambling for the ball. It looks like it just barely grazed Ted Zilliger's bat, then bounced off it, and it's ruled a fly ball. The umpire is signalling that the formidable Sprunk has caught it for out of town to end the seventh inning. It's a bad break for home team. That's how the last play would have looked, football fans, if this had been a game of baseball. Bah. You might as well transport this game to the moon. No sooner said than done. Just a twiddle here, a twiddle there. On the screen, there appears a desolate crater-pitted field with two teams in spacesuits facing each other, immobile. All at once, the two teams fly into motion and the players are making great bounds into the air, sometimes over the heads of other players. The ball is thrown into the air and sails so high that it almost disappears, and then slowly comes floating down into the arms of one space-suited player roughly a quarter mile from where it was released. And there, friends, you have the subjunctive instant replay as it would have happened on the moon. We'll be right back after this important commercial message from the friendly folks who brew Glumpf beer, my favourite kind of beer. If I weren't so lazy, I would take that broken TV back to the dealer myself. But alas, it's my fate to be a lazy sloth. Oh. That's a marvellous invention, Mr. Clam. May I suggest the hypothetical? Of course. What would that last player look like if space were four-dimensional? Oh, uh, that's a complicated one, Mr. T, but I believe I can code it into the dials. Just a moment. Hmm. Let me see. I think this should do it. And now let's watch the subjunctive instant replay. A confusing array of twisted pipes appears on the screen. It grows larger, then smaller, and for a moment seems to do something akin to rotation. Then it turns into a strange mushroom-shaped object and back to a bunch of pipes. As it metamorphoses from this into other bizarre shapes, the announcer gives his commentary. Ted Zilliger's fading back to pass. He spots Palindromi ten yards outfield and passes it to the right and outwards. It looks good. Palindromi's at the 35-yard plane, the 40, and he's tackled on his own 43-yard plane. And there you have it, 3D fans, as it would have looked if football were played in four spatial dimensions. What is it you're doing, Mr. Crab, when you twirl these various dials on the control panel? I am selecting the proper subjunctive channel. You see, there are all sorts of subjunctive channels broadcasting simultaneously, and I want to tune in precisely that one which represents the kind of hypothetical which has been suggested. Can you do this on any TV? No, most TVs can't receive subjunctive channels. They require a special kind of circuit which is quite difficult to make. How do you know which channel is broadcasting what? Do you look it up in the newspaper? I don't need to know the channel's call letters. Instead, I tune it in by coding in these dials the hypothetical situation which I want to be represented. Technically, this is called addressing a channel by its counterfactual parameters. There are always a large number of channels broadcast in every conceivable world. All the channels which carry worlds that are near to each other have call letters that are near to each other too. Why did you not have to turn the dials after all the first time before subjunctive into the replay? Oh, that was because I was tuned into a channel which is very near to the reality channel, but ever so slightly off. So every once in a while it deviates from reality. It's nearly impossible to tune exactly into the reality channel, but that's all right because it's so dull. All their instant replays are straight. Can you imagine? What a bore. I find the whole idea of subjunct TV is one giant bore. But perhaps I could change my mind if I had some evidence that your machine here could handle an interesting counterfactual. For example... How would that last play have looked if addition were not commutative? Oh dear, oh my. That change is a little too radical, I'm afraid, for this model. I unfortunately don't have a superjunk TV, which is the top of the line. Superjunk TVs can handle anything you throw at them. Bah. But look, I can do almost as well. Wouldn't you like to see how the last play would have happened if 13 went for prime number? 
No thanks. That doesn't make any sense. Anyway, if I were the last play, I'd be getting pretty tired of being trotted out time and again in new garb for the likes of you fuzzy-headed complex slippers. Let's get on with the game. Where did you get this subjunctive aristocrat? Believe it or not, Mr Sloth and I went to a country fair the other evening, and it was offered as the first prize in a lottery. Normally, I don't indulge in such frivolity, but some crazy impulse grabbed me and I bought one ticket. What about you, Mr Sloth? I admit I bought one just to humour old crab. And when the winning number was announced, I found to my amazement that I'd won the lottery. Fantastic! I've never known anyone who won anything in a lottery before. I was flabbergasted at my good fortune. Don't you have something else to tell us about that lottery, Crab? Oh, nothing much. It's just that my ticket number was 129. Now, when they announced the winning number, it was 128, just one off. So you see, he actually didn't win it at all. He almost won, though. I prefer to say that I won it, you see, for I came so terribly close. If my number had been only one smaller, I would have won. But unfortunately, Crab, a miss is as good as a mile. Oh, that's bad. What about you, Mr. Sloak? What was your number? Mine is 256, the next power of 2 above 128. Surely that counts as a hit if anything does. I can't understand why, however, those fair officials, those unfair officials, were so thick-headed about it. They refused to award me my fully deserved prize. Some other joker claimed he deserved it because his number was 128. I think my number was far closer than his, but you can't fight City Hall. I'm all confused. If you didn't win the subjunct TV after all, Mr. Crabbe, then how can we have been sitting here all afternoon watching it? It seems as if we ourselves have been living in some sort of hypothetical world that would have been had circumstances just been ever so slightly different. And that, folks, was how the afternoon of Mr. Crabbe's would have been spent had he won subjunct TV. But since he didn't, the four friends simply spent a pleasant afternoon watching home team get creamed 128 to nil. Or was it 256 to nil? Oh well, it hardly matters in five-dimensional Plutonian steam.